you co-founded the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, also known as FIRE, a legendary organization that fights for the freedom of speech for all Americans in our courtrooms, on our campuses, and in our culture. So let's start with a big question. What is freedom of speech? First of all, the organization, when I co-founded it in 1999, was called the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. It focused on free speech issues on college campuses in academia. And only earlier this year did we decide to expand our reach beyond the campuses, which is why the name, although the acronym FIRE remains, it's now the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. The E used to be education. The E used to be education, it's now expression. And we basically do a lot of the cases the ACLU used to do. The ACLU now more is as the, the, a progressive uh, organization rather than a civil liberties organization. And, um, and we've taken the, um, the, the role of dealing with free speech in, in the society generally. In, and now this is a particularly um, uh, an era prone to censorship. Um, everybody thinks they're right and that and people who disagree with them should not be able to voice their views. It's a very difficult period right now, both on campus and off campus. Um, it's about as, as intolerant an era as I can remember. In, I'm, I'm gonna be 81 May 10th. I was born on Mother's Day, 1942. And I can't remember it being this bad. I was born during the McCarthy era. Um, so that says a lot. And um, it sort of reminds me of that. Well, let's start with that, almost a philosophical question, a legal question, a human question. What is this freedom that you care so much about, that you fought for so much, freedom of speech? It is the most important right that Americans have. It's not a coincidence or an accident that it's named in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Without it, no democratic society can be democratic for long. And I'm an absolutist. That is, um, I believe that, for example, people say to me, but what about hate speech? Well, hate speech is much more important than love speech. And the reason is, I'm much more interested in knowing whom I should not turn my back on that I am interested in figuring out who loves me or who likes me. So uh, hate speech is the most important in my view, and yet it's uh, it's banned in, for example, schools. It's unbelievable. Um, kids are uh, not schooled into uh, understanding the glory of the First Amendment when, when schools uh, say to them they shouldn't say things that are gonna make somebody feel bad. Um, I mean, the purpose of speech is to express honest views that people have. And um, so I believe hate speech is as important as love speech, and my view is more important. So it should be brought to the surface rather than operate in the shadows. Absolutely, absolutely. What is the connection between freedom of speech and freedom of thought? Well, in a free society, th thoughts, start in the brain and then they come out the mouth. So they're different ends of the same spectrum. So to you, the censorship of speech eventually leads to a censorship of thought. Of course, censorship of the mode by which other people know what you're thinking. So there's some aspect of our society that is, uh, that thinking is done collectively and without being able to speak to each other, we cannot do this kind of collective Correct. thinking. And out of speech, the theory is that ultimately out of speech comes truth. That isn't necessarily so, but I do think that when there's free speech, better decisions are made because people put their views on the table in a frank, accurate way. And then those views mix together and clash and out of that, usually, uh, comes the better the better uh, decision. Um, not always, but usually, or more more often than not. But if somebody is not allowed to be a, you know uh, uh, sit at the table of decision making, then the decision making process is poorer, um, less robust, less diverse, and ultimately less successful. 
So can you uh, elaborate on the idea of free speech absolutism? So hate speech can be quite painful to quite a large number of people. Does well, this worry you? Yep. Uh, living in a free society requires that you expose yourself to some discomfort, you call it pain. It's maybe emotional pain, it's not physical pain. Um, but it's uh, it's the price we pay for living in a free society. Every so often we're insulted, we're uh, emotionally hurt. Think of the alternative. All the alternatives are worse. Nobody ever promised us a rose garden. We're lucky to be in a country that has the First Amendment. It's also the only, it's the most diverse country in the world because of immigration. I mean, my my grandparents, uh, my father's side came over from Russia. Uh, my mother's side came over from Poland. I'm very happy that my grandparents came in from Russia. Uh, I would not want to be in Russia today. I'd probably be sharing a cell with a Wall Street Journal reporter. Um, so um, I'm, I'm thankful that they came in. And um, this is a great country. It's got troubles right now, but our country doesn't. And we've had, after we had a civil war, we had segregation, uh, we had the uh, decimation of the Indians. We're not perfect, but it's the best place in the world for somebody who values liberty. So you don't think that hate speech can empower large groups that uh, eventually lead to physical action, to physical harm to others? No, I don't. I think that that um, we have developed a culture in which um, it's understood that if you don't like what you hear, you you talk back. Mm -hmm. um, you write. You write something. Um, um, we don't punch each other. We insult each other. Um, is insulting great? Well, I don't know, it's okay. I used to, as a kid in Brooklyn, where I was born, I was born and raised in Bensonhurst, we used to say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never harm me. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true. It was, what was true when I was five is true when I'm, I'm almost 81. So I've lived a long time, I've seen it all. And I'm talking from experience as well as theory. It's what happens when you reach your 80s. <laughs> <laughs> I read that you had this line that you cannot be protected from being called an asshole. Correct. Okay. Especially if you're an asshole. <laughs> well, that's, uh, uh, but you don't have to be an asshole to be called an asshole. That's correct. And uh, I think the internet has taught me that. Well, the internet has posed a, a particular challenge to free speech absolutists because of some of the stuff that's on there is God awful. But I have no different rule for freedom of speech on the internet than I have uh, in newspapers or in lectures or in classrooms or or conversations among people. What do you think about uh, the tension between freedom of speech and freedom of reach, as is uh, kind of sometimes termed? So the internet really challenges that aspect. It allows well, speech yep. to become viral and spread uh, very quickly to a very large number of people. Yeah, well, you know, we've had We've had revolutions in um, in in uh, the modalities of communication. <clears throat> After all, newspapers were, were the first challenge. Um, radio and television posed a, a new challenge. Um, the FCC tried, but ultimately gave up the attempt to control um, obscenity, for example. Um, and the Supreme Court has been pretty close. The one thing that liberal and conservative Supreme Courts, right now we're in a conservative era due to Trump nom nom nominations. Um, during the, much, much of my life, we were the Warren Court, it was uh, William O. Douglas, so Brennan, it was a liberal court. Well, one thing they agree on is free speech. They don't agree on much else but they do agree on free speech. And I think the reason is that they recognize that, well, my group is in the ascendance today, but it may not be tomorrow. And I want to have objective, clear rules so that when I'm in the minority, I'm able to voice my opinion. 
And so uh, it's one of the few things that both sides of the political spectrum agree on. The only people who don't are the, the people way over on the right that I call the fascists and the people way over on the left who are the communists. Um, but with respect to most people in this on the political spectrum, Republicans, Democrats, socialists, libertarians, um, uh, they agree on the primacy of free speech because it protects them when when protection is needed. So to you, even on the internet, free speech absolutism should rule. Yes. Nobody's gonna die. Remember, death threats are not, law, are not protected. Um, nobody's gonna die. So people are going to be a little bit insulted. That's the price you pay for living in a free society. And it's a small price, in my view. Um, people, Some people don't have as tough a hide as others. Well, then develop it. Um, I, hope, I, don't want, I don't mean to sound uh, cruel, um, but you know, you're living in a free society. You develop a tough hide. So that's the cost uh, of living in a free society. Yep, there are, there's a cost. The thing is, it, it can really hurt at scale to be cyberbullied, to be attacked for the ideas you express, or maybe ideas you didn't express, but that uh, somebody decided to lie about you and uh, use that to, to attack you. Well, first of all, there are, there, are some, there are some exceptions to the First Amendment. Libel and slander is an exception. Um, direct threats are an exception. You know, if you if you say such and such, I will murder you. That is not lawful. If you say that somebody, um, if, if you say about somebody, oh, you know, um, you beat your wife, um, that that is not lawful. If in fact the person knows you don't beat your wife, there are some limits. Defamation is one. Direct threats are another. Um, so it's not absolute. This is not the First Amendment is not absolute. But it's, just, it's more absolute than it is in any other society, and it's pretty near absolute. Um, for, for example, fraud. If you uh, sell somebody a, a car and you say, oh, this is in great running shape, and in fact it's an old jalopy and it's not going to make it more than 10 miles, that's fraud. That's not free speech. Um, so we, free speech is not absolute. There are these limits, but they're very narrow, specific categories of limits. But uh, there's gray area here because while legally you're not allowed to defame a person, in the court of public opinion, especially with the aid of anonymity on the internet, rumors can spread at scale. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people can make up things about you. You have to defend yourself. Uh, using you know, more speech. We're, we're big, we're through freedom of speech, and we're big boys and girls. Um, you have to defend yourself. Um, you know, in, in, in some societies, if you say something, uh, uh, if you, right now, if you say something nasty about Putin, you'll end up in the gulag. Um, if you say something nasty about um, Biden, you end up in the New York Times. Where would you rather be?